So, well, Dobry then, I mean, I think um, and I want to first of all thank Thomas for inviting me and all the people of the organization. It's been superb these days. And uh, I have to tell you that this is my first time, uh, many first times here. First of all, first time I'm presenting in Europe. I've done this in a few countries, but never in Europe. Um, first time in the Czech Republic. And uh, last weekend, as my wife, who's around there, uh, she likes trail running. We were in, uh, in Pilsen and doing uh, some trail running there. And as we just, as I just crossed the finish line, usually in other places they receive you with water or maybe some of these uh, sports beverages and things like that. But they, they received me with beer. So I thought, I think I like this country. <laughs> yeah. even, even when you, you do two, hour, two hours of running, you get beer. So let's go with, uh, with the presentation. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, gRPC, uh, this new framework, this new protocol for, um, for creating and then uh, interacting with web services. And uh, first of all, who, who of you have already used gRPC? Could you please raise your hand? Ah, uh, and one third or so. So you are going to get very bored <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not going to tell anything that you don't already know. For the rest of us, I hope it's, this is going to be interesting. Most of the material uh, is going to be introductory. Uh, but uh, I do have a couple of examples that probably you will like. OK, so let's go on with this. Um, what we are going to talk about, first of all, uh, what is gRPC about? A little bit of uh, concepts and theory and the goals of the people that designed this, uh, this protocol. Then we'll see a little bit of code, a very, very simple example, the hello world of gRPC, if you like. Then we'll discuss performance and why gRPC um, is so good uh, with speed and with bandwidth. Uh, uh, after that, we discuss the streaming, which is a um, um, especially attractive aspect of gRPC. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the streaming uh, allows you in a one single um, HTTP session, send multiple messages, multiple calls in just one session. So, so that opens up uh, the door for a number of possibilities. We'll see some examples of streaming as time allows us. Uh, I don't know, we will see two, three, or maybe even four. And once we already have general ideas about gRPC and how it works, we will compare it with uh, the usual stuff. Uh, how many of you use uh, Web API already? Can you raise your hand? OK, so uh, almost everyone. So we'll compare it with gRPC. Uh, of course, gRPC is, uh, doesn't mean to replace totally Web API. Web API is alive and well. gRPC has a specific scenarios where it shines. But there are other places where you still want to use Web API. and. Uh, and uh, so that, that will finish the discussion. When we want to use one, when we want to use the other. OK, let's go ahead. And uh, well, first of all, who's behind gRPC? gRPC right now is a part of the Cloud uh, Computing Native, Native Foundation, uh, an organization where, uh, with members like Amazon, uh, Google, Microsoft, IBM, all the guys that are trying to, to push cloud computing. Uh, the uh, official site of, of that organization is there. Uh, also, uh, one interesting aspect of gRPC is it tries really hard to be as uh, multi-platform as possible. So as you can see, there are several uh, implementations, uh, Python, Java, Go, Swift, PHP, .NET, of course, which includes C Sharp, uh, F Sharp, and Visual Basic .NET. And uh, OK, what's uh, gRPC about? For me, the m maybe the most important thing is that um, it's about, in the design sign, about designing APIs oriented to the business. What do I mean by that? Uh, probably during the last 10 years or so, we've, we've got incrementally uh, used to uh, web API or REST APIs, if you want. And REST APIs. The center, or, or the idea behind it, is that uh, you have entities, all kinds of entities. 
customers, products, invoices, orders, whatever you want. And then you have to work with these entities, create them, modify them, delete them, uh, filter them, search them, etc. Okay, so it's an, if you want, it's an entity-oriented world when you work with uh, REST APIs. Many scenarios are just okay with that, but several others, not so much. On the other hand, we can think of an application as a number of uh, business processes. Make an order, uh, do a payment, uh, cancel a contract, etc. So uh, when you think this way, you are creating an API not based on entities, but on operation, on business operations, okay? And I think that uh, gRPC shines better when you approach uh, when you approach your problem through this business processes idea. Okay, that's that's the first thing on on gRPC. If you want to get a little technical, that means that uh, you usually create a contract which defines the operations and which define the data structure structures. Excuse me, that are uh, that are interchanged by these operations. Well, uh, if that sounds to many of you a little bit like a Windows Communication Foundation, and by the way, how many of you have used Windows Communication Foundation? Almost everyone, that of course, uh, again, includes me. Uh, I was saying, if that sounds like WCF, it's because it's architecturally like WCF. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit the differences and what uh, what advantages gRPC offer, offers, but from a high-level point of view, it occupies the same space as WCF. Okay. Uh, the second thing is about trying to do as efficient as possible the communication be between the consumer and the producer, be between the front end and the back end. And it does it in two ways. First of all, try to make as fast and as low CPU consuming as possible, the serialization and deserialization of data. Uh, getting ahead of myself, uh, basically what you use is a binary protocol. Instead of using XML text or JSON, which is more efficient than XML but still text, you use binary text, uh, binary, uh, sorry, binary payloads with, with gRPC. And uh, uh, the, uh, the second thing is that uh, these binary payloads tend to be smaller, sometimes really, really smaller than the JSON and XML counterparts. So you also use very uh, small uh, data transfer rates, okay? That's, that's the second aspect of gRPC. The third thing is that uh, they try to make it as interoperable as possible, as multi-language as possible. So you can have a backend in, say, Java, and a frontend in uh, Ruby, or a backend in C Sharp, and a frontend in, uh, I don't know, Swift in, uh, in an iPhone, for example. That's all perfectly plausible. It was design thinking in that kind of a scenario as gRPC. Okay. And then there are the, the really nice things like uh, what they call call streaming. And uh, when you do call streaming, basically you open a channel, a point-to-point -point communication, if you like, between the producer and the consumer. And inside this uh, pre-established channel, you can exchange as many messages and also in both directions, uh, from the consumer to the server, but also from the server to the consumer. So call streaming is another interesting ability that gRPC provides us. Okay. If you are really technical, and if you uh, uh, don't think too much about these uh, astronautic architects and things like that, what you could say is basically gRPC is um, use the new abilities of the HTTP2 protocol and add it with protobuf, uh, this uh, very efficient uh, serialization and deserialization protocol created by Google, which, uh, by the way, gRPC um, supposedly is uh, Google RPC, but as you can see, the official name is a little bit more funny there. Okay, so let's go to our first example. Uh, what we are going to do very quickly is just create a server, um, check the contract, and the contract is a protofile, 
then, uh, then uh, we'll check uh, the implementation, just quickly see the C-sharp code that uh, implements the service. And after that, we create the client. So let's go to, uh, to, 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 let me see where it is. Where you are, my friend? Here it is. OK, great. And uh, command prompt. Here we go. So with uh, .NET Framework 3.0, one interesting uh, thing there is that we have a specific template for creating uh, backends or gRPC backends. The name is gRPC, as you can see there. And um, we can name it, uh, excuse me, for example, gRPC greeter. Let's see if I'm not making any obvious mistake. No, I don't think so. Uh, so we are just creating this uh, server. Server is created. And let's quickly check the code on gRPC greeter. OK. There we go. Oh, it opened up here. I'm moving it there right now. So the first uh, interesting thing for us is the proto file. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it before, this is a, a DSL, and a specific language, exactly for describing uh, messages and services. Okay. Uh, as you can see there, let me just close this guy here. Uh, you can uh, you define a package, in this case, greet. You define a service. The service is named greeter. And inside a service, you can define as many operations as, uh, as you need, 2, 3, 10, whatever. Okay. In this case, it's an RPC operation. This is the name of the operation. Um, this is the type of, in this case, we, we have just one argument we are for this operation. And this operation returns uh, something of type hello reply. And down here, you can see the definition of, first of all, the uh, request, uh, the type, and name of the fields. And what this is is the position, meaning that um, uh, uh, gRPC or protocol buffers, to be exact, defines the strict order in which the fields will be serialized. Okay, this is important. We'll see later uh, why. Okay. And this is the uh, reply. Uh, the, the protocol buffers or the proto buff of, uh, language is easy enough to learn the basics in just a couple of hours. And then, of course, as you need uh, anything additional information, th there is a number of sources. Proto buff is pretty popular, and not only in the uh, web services space. For example, there are some databases that actually, that actually store the information as uh, as proto files or using the protocol buffers protocol, okay. So so it's not only for web services, great. And that's our server. And if I didn't I didn't do anything terrible, if I just uh, get it running, we'll have for uh, Kest uh, we'll have a Kestrel server running, and there it is. And we have already uh, our first uh, gRPC service running. If we have time, we'll come back here to see how we initialize the uh, the uh, the Kestrel uh, environment to to start the web service and to use the gRPC services. Okay, but right now, right now, let's go and create the client if you want. And um, for that, I'm just going to create a plain console. Okay, and uh, let's call this gRPC. Greeter client. Okay. It's just a plain console application. Of course, if you are creating, for example, a ASP.NET website, you can use code pretty similar or actually totally similar to the one I'm going to show you uh, in order for your ASP.NET uh, application to, to call to a to a gRPC service, no problem. OK, so that's the first thing. Now let's go to that uh, client. And there are a couple of packages we need there. So in order not to torture you with my 
with my slow typing, I'm just going to copy, let me see, the packages we need. Where are you? Hope you just wake it up. Give me just one second. Okay, there are three packages that we need as a minimum for this to work. Uh, two provided by Microsoft and one provided by Google. Here we are. And uh, there we go. Uh, those three packages, don't worry about the exact names. I'm just doing a .NET add packages. I, I'll show you in a minute, in just a minute, what is it that we just did? Uh huh. There, here we are. And all I did, nothing fancy really, is add these three packages: Google Protobuf yeah, for serializing and deserializing stuff. And the second one is gRPC Net Client, which which is actually the uh, the NuGet packages, NuGet package, excuse me, that works in .NET Core doing all the communication, the gRPC communication. And gRPC tools is an interesting guy. It, it actually, it, uses, it, use, it is used at compile time for um, generating C-sharp code from the protofiles. And talking about the protofiles, remember that uh, this protofile here, this one right there, um, defines the contract of our communication. So the client needs this protofile, and uh, you can you can share it in a, in, a, in a number of ways, whichever way you want. Uh, I'm going to do the simplest thing, which is, which is just uh, to copy it and put it in the other side in the client project here. Okay, uh, let me create a folder. Just for convention, I'm using the same name, but. That's not really necessary. Okay, and uh, passed. Yeah, and this very primitive operation is what allow us to share the contract between the server and the client. Remember that for every language, Python, C sharp, F sharp, Java, uh, they they give you a generator. Generator, excuse me, that takes this protofile and generates the corresponding code for the consumer or for the server or whichever one. Okay, as we need that generation, we also need these small three lines here. And also, I have to tell you that if you are using Visual Studio, actually uh, these steps are done magically if you want. But I do prefer to show you what's going on step by step. So basically, this that uh, small line there, protobuf include, etc., is what um, makes MS Build generate uh, the C sharp code for the customer. Okay, we are almost there. Uh, let's go to the main program. And again, let me just copy the code and uh, explain it to you. In a second, there we go. Uh, here we are. Okay, this is our uh, this is our consumer. Uh, let me show you one of two interesting things here. Okay, uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, we first of all create a gRPC channel for a specific URL. This URL must be the same as the one we have in the in the uh, in exposing the server. Then we are creating this greeter client, and this greeter client is the guy that uh, actually gets um, gets generated from the protofile. I don't, I never actually write that code. You can check it if you want, but you don't really need it. It's pretty much the same, uh, the same situation with service reference on Windows Communication Foundation. It's pretty much the same. And then finally, we are doing a, an async call by the way, with gRPC, you can make synchronous and asynchronous call. Uh, and finally, as you can see, we are um, uh, making the call and sending the data with an object of type hello request, which is, if you remember, exactly the name of the, of the type, of the message type that, uh, that gRPC is expecting in the contract. 
Okay, and that's pretty much it. That's the, the lines from uh, 13 to 16 is what defines the way uh, you in C Sharp call uh, one of these services. Okay, that's it. Okay, so now let's go here. And let's see if. Uh, okay. And uh, as the server is already running, remember that. If I say .NET run, uh, what we'll see, that silly hello world there, <laughs> it's uh, the information sent from the server to the, to the client. And that's pretty much uh, creating a server and a client. So the basics are very simple. So I just wanted to, to show you that there's not that much complexity there. And uh, now let's go ahead and see a number of uh, interesting things. What you see in the left is a typical uh, JSON uh, uh, serialized object, okay? And uh, you can see the size. And uh, on the right, the correspondent or uh, gRPC payload, which first of all is in binary. But even if it's is if it's in binary, uh, you probably are thinking, huh? Couldn't be that small, okay? Couldn't be that small, uh, but it is between a lot of things because remember the producer and the consumer share the contract. So you don't need to send the names or the structure. You don't need those words there, query, page number, result per page, ticket, tickers, name, value, etc. You don't need anything uh, of that, just the pure data, just the pure data. Of course, what you pay is that the client need needs to know the contract, and that's why I copied the protofile. So you win something, you pay something. But actually, you win a lot because in the right, you can see a, a comparison of sizes between uh, JSON, realistic JSON files and protobuf, um, protobuf files, okay? So the size not only, not only uh, help us in, uh, in low CPU uh, consumption, as you can see, there are some statistics. The blue ones are for um, uh, for the classical JSON serialization, and the red ones are uh, are for gRPC or protobuf serialization. Um, in this case, of course, bigger is better, and you can see that the, there are important differences uh, uh, in, in the CPU consumption or the speed of generation, the speed of serialization, and the speed of deserialization. Okay. And uh, the other side of the equation is, of course, um, is of course uh, the latency, and the latency is going to be smaller because we have smaller messages. Again, we are comparing a few um, a few examples of classical uh, uh, REST services in Python and in Java. That Spark, by the way, that has nothing to do with the Spark big data big data uh, thing. But it's uh, it's a small uh, web services server for Java. Okay, uh, but anyways, uh, in, in this case, the, the smaller the better. And as you can see, the uh, blue line, which is gRPC, the latest one, has consistently the better uh, latency. Uh, what you're seeing is um, how many packages have uh, small, not so small, and then really big, and finally ugly latency sending lots, thousands of packages. You can see the details in that, uh, in that URL. And as you can see, most packages in gRPC has a very slow latency. And there is just a small percentage that, uh, that uh, has low latency anyways. Okay? So, we win, uh, so we win both ways. We, we win using less CPU and less memory when we serialize and deserialize. And we win uh, using uh, less bandwidth. Okay. Great. So, next thing, uh, cold streaming. That's an interesting thing. Uh, the first uh, graphic on the left up, uh, it's what we usually do most of the time with web API or with uh, Windows Communication Foundation. In uh, gRPC, this is called unary communication. The client sends a message and waits synchronously or asynchronously, whatever way, it waits for uh, uh, one answer from the server, okay? That's what we do all the time, 
and you can do that in, uh, in gRPC, of course. That's exactly what we did in, uh, in our last example. Okay. But then you can do what they call server streaming, the second one uh, in the right app. Okay. And uh, the idea is uh, the following. The client makes just one call, just one call, but it, it says, hey, server, I expect many answers for this one call. You send me as many as you want. Two, 20, 200, 2,000, as many as you want. And then the server in that specific channel, which is already open, starts to send as many answers as it has. Till when? Till one of three things. The server is, ex is exhausted and it, come, uh, it informs the client, hey, I don't have any more information for you. Second, the client says, I have enough. And the client says, you know, I don't want any more packages. If, if, even if you have additional information, I don't want it anymore. And, uh, and the client can also kill the communication channel if you want, okay? Uh, the third thing is pretty much the same, but in the other direction. The client opens a communication and it says, uh, you know, I'm, I have uh, information that I want to send you several packages, okay, in this single channel. And the server starts to wait in a in a loop if, if you want. If you want, not it's not really a loop because it it doesn't use polling, but it keeps waiting. So it receives one message and two and ten and two hundred and two thousand and whatever it needs. Till when? Till the server says I've had enough, so I'm killing the channel. Or the client says I don't have any more, and the client kills the channel. At the end. At the very end, the server sends one last answer with a, a, a final response to all the processing it, it, it has done, it has been done, okay? That's client streaming. And finally, finally, we have uh, what we call bi uh, bidirectional streaming. And in this case, as you can see there, uh, uh, actually the channel has, you know, two lanes. In one lane, the client is sending one message and two and three and four. And in the other lane, asynchronously, the server is sending back one, two, three, four, five answers. Okay, You can also do that. So any combination of these ideas uh, you can make. Uh, for those of you that know HTTP2, probably you're thinking, uh, uh, well, but uh, that's exactly what the HTTP2 allows you to do. And yeah, as I said before, a gRPC, all it does is provide us a nice uh, layer above these uh, HTTP2 capabilities. Um, for some of you that are wondering, uh, that's interesting. And uh, indeed, for example, in, IO in IoT scenarios, uh, the, this last one here sounds really interesting because the device could start to send uh, signal after signal after signal after signal to the server uh, in order to process it in w just one single open channel. But maybe it's not that necessary, say, in a regular website. Let me show you uh, the classical example of how much ca could this difference mean in a more day-to-day uh, -day situation, if you want. This is typical uh, example. This image is actually made of, uh, I don't know how many dozens of tiles. So it's made of a number of small rectangles. The one in the right is exactly the same one. The difference is the first one is going to be called uh, with uh, the classical one by one call. So we are having, I don't know, like 500 calls to a web service that sends us, sends us every tile. And in the second case, we are using streaming. So let's see. How's the difference there? Let me refresh the first one. And it took a little bit over one second to bring all the tiles here. When we use HTTP2, we are getting uh, roughly half the, uh, uh, it takes half the time to, ta uh, to get the information. Again, we are receiving 500 or so tiles, uh, small rectangles, uh, but using a, a streaming channel. And as you can see, the difference is pretty clear, 50% there. So you can use this uh, even if you are not in an IoT uh, environment of, or things like that. OK? Great. So with that, let me go back.
to our sites. And uh, let's try and see a few more examples uh, to see, for example, how server streaming works. Let me see where we are. Well, first of all, first of all, and before I do anything ugly, let me stop this server here. The one that that used for my first example. Because if I don't kill it, then the ones that I'm about to show you won't uh, work either. OK, let's see. It's refusing to die. Nice. OK. Let's kill it. There it goes. OK, so bye-bye. Uh-huh. And let me also kill the, uh, the little example that we created together. Great. Now. We can go to the um, to our examples, examples that we are going to check. Let me see. And the first one is, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, our uh, server example. There we go. First of all, um, what we are, no, no, no. First of all, excuse me, I'm going for a harder one unnecessarily. Let me open this other one first. Excuse me. Greeter. OK. This one. Here we are. OK. So first of all, in principle, the, uh, in principle, the proto file is exactly the same or almost the same uh, of uh, my first example. You say hello, and you receive a reply that basically say hello, and that's it. But pay attention to line uh, 23. And the uh, interesting difference is that you can see here uh, is that we have stream, the stream keyword there. And it, we are saying there in the contract that for just one call from the client, the server is going to send many answers in that uh, channel open with a single call from the client. Okay, that's basically the way you express server streaming. Okay, and the rest I think is pretty much the same. If I'm not wrong, yeah, that's correct. Okay, uh, let's see the server again just to check out how it's uh, written. Wait a second, and uh, that's the server or service. Here it is. Okay, so uh, we have the server, and the server, there's nothing really interesting in it. Oh, by the way, wh when, we, when we created the first service, I, I think I didn't show you this code, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> that's, that's for going too fast. But this one is exactly the same that was generated last time, so let's take the chance. Uh, that's the way you uh, implement an operation. Uh, as you can see, you're using a, an overwrite, and that's because our uh, service, um, as you can see, our service inherits from greeter base. Greeter base is generated from the proto file, and greeter base provides us with a default implementation of the operations. Of course, that default Im implementations do practically nothing. <laughs> they respond with an empty message usually. So. What we do here is we start to override those guys. You can see that uh, um, the operations are implicitly asynchronic. That's why the task is there. Uh, we receive the data, and also we receive the context information. And in the context information, you have access to all kind of metadata, you know, the HTTP headers, uh, the uh, user tokens uh, for authentication, authorization, etc. All that stuff, you get it in this, in this object here, okay? Which in real life is indispensable. And uh, to, to send back the result, we, j we just return uh, from result call with, uh, with an object. This type hello reply was again generated in C sharp from the proto definition. Okay, okay, but this one is the uh, is the old one. It has no surprises there. The one far more interesting, and let me close this for a second, is the say hellos, because remember this guy was uh, 
uh, a str uh, uh, answers, excuse me, with a stream. And as you can see, things get far more interesting because you receive the initial request. Here it is, just one request from the user, but you are expected to return a stream. Okay, that's that's the interesting difference. And again, you have the context. So this uh, iServer stream writer, for us, is a stream like a file stream, very similar to a file stream. Um, and what do we do? While we don't get a cancellation token from the, uh, from the, uh, the consumer, from the client, we keep on doing this, whatever it is. And every time we write an object to the stream, a new message is sent to the customer. So in this case, we are just sending one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, messages to the, uh, to the, uh, to the customer. Uh, and just to make things visible, they are making an await here, just waiting a second. In real life, of course, you want to go as fast as possible, okay? So that's a streaming uh, service in gRPC. Now, Let's see the consumer, the ones that takes this information. So that guy is this other guy here in client and in program. Here it is. Nothing interesting in principle. We have the client, uh, the address. Uh, uh, we are making a regular call, which is exactly the one we made uh, a few minutes ago. And then we make a streaming call. And the, this streaming call is the one that's interesting, okay? So the unary call, no surprises there. We are calling the say hello async with one message and receive the answer, okay? Uh, the interesting one is the server calling one, okay? As you can see, uh, we create a cancellation token. We are getting ready to send a message of uh, in the style of it's enough to the server, and we are just doing it after three and a half seconds. Yeah. It's just for example. So we create a client, but this time for the say hello, and we send, remember that in, it, in this case we are sending just one message to the server, just one message, and start to receive several responses from the server, okay? And how do we receive those several responses? The magical line is line 59. We make an await for each, and this await for each will asynchronously wait for every message that, send, that uh, is sent by the server. In our case, remember the server was stopping every second, we will receive around three messages, three, four messages, depending on the situation, from the server and uh, we receive it as a stream, okay? And uh, what we do with every message that we receive is just process it. In this case, we are just saying uh, greeting, hello, whatever, uh, to message one, message two, message three, etc. okay? When finally the conversation is canceled, uh, we just say uh, the stream was closed. So closing the stream, there are uh, a few ways of closing the streams, but uh, in this case, we are doing it, uh, you know, this way. We are creating a cancellation token and uh, making that cancellation token uh, start itself after three seconds. We can also explicitly send a cancellation if we want. And that's pretty much it. That's, uh, that's what makes this thing work. Okay, so... Um, as we have not so many time, let me let me show you another example. Wonder, first of all, uh, do you have any questions about this specific code here? No, nobody says nothing. That always worries me because <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I'm boring everyone or nobody is interested in, in understanding anything or I'm being super clear. <laughs> I'm never sure. <laughs> okay. So let's go with the, with the counter guy. And this guy illustrates uh, the streaming the other way around. In this case, in this case, uh, remember, the customer is sending several messages 
but the server is processing them uh, uh, during one session, if you want, okay? During just one session. All the messages that, that keep coming. And uh, uh, to begin with, we are not sure if we are going to get one, 100 or 1,000 messages in this specific communication, okay? So, uh, so here we are in the counter guy. And uh, let's see, as the interesting one here is the, uh, well, first of all, let's see the protofile. First things first, okay. And uh, what we are doing, what we are going to do is interesting in this example. We have the counter uh, service, and we have, first of all, the increment count service. This guy just adds one. Every time we call it, it adds to a counter one, 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 one. And, they, and this other guy here, accumulate count, on the other hand, uh, adds uh, an arbitrary number. It could add five or 10 or, or 15 or whichever number you want. So what we are going to do is uh, to call once increment count, and then we, ca we will call accumulate several times. But you know, the server will keep on adding the numbers by the way, uh, this increment count doesn't have or doesn't need any um, any arguments uh, when you when you make a call. So uh, protobuf has this specific uh, value empty, which actually means I'm not sending any payload. Yeah, the uh, the HTTP two body, if you want, uh, will be just empty. Okay. Uh, okay, that's the first thing, and the counter request and counter reply just have the number, no? The number that we are um, that we are sending back and forth. Great, uh, and the client program is this guy. Okay, and, and as you can see, we are creating an accumulate count client, we are just, in this case, three times generating a random number, whichever it is, it doesn't matter, and we are calling uh, through the request stream. Here is where the magic is happening, because every time we go through line 58, another message is sent uh, as part of the same session. Yeah, you can send as many messages as you want, and uh, when the client sends a uh, complete async in line 62, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the conversation, that the specific conversation is closed, okay? So that's what it takes to implement, let me go to the slides for a second. That's what it takes to implement this uh, guy down here, yeah, clean and streaming, okay? Not hard as you can see, okay, great. Now let's see how the server sees the world. And the server, we have the service here, this counter service, okay. Uh, the counter service uh, by itself has the increment count. This one is a regular guy, so it receives just one call and returns one value. I do want you to note that uh, you see here, this is the service, right? And this guy is receiving, when we instantiate this server, this object, excuse me, an incrementing counter object. Uh, this is actually an a static object, so we just have one instance of this object, just one, okay? This one only instance is reused every time for every call, and there's the, uh, there, that's the place where we keep accumulating the data, okay? So, well, how many of you have used um, dependency injection in ASP.NET? Almost everyone, so I'm using regular dependency injection from ASP.NET to do that trick. So that's n nothing to do with gRPC, it's regular DI, everyday DI. Okay, great. So, uh, the interesting guy is the accumulate count, because this guy, uh, is designed to keep receiving messages. And for, uh, to keep receiving, or in order to keep receiving messages, we need two things. First of all, 
you see the parameter here, uh, is of type uh, AI async stream reader from whichever type it is. Okay, that's where the magic is in this definition here. And then it's almost the same that we used in the client in the previous example, almost the same that we used in the, in the previous example, um, except that uh, now the for each is here. So every time the client sends a message, a message, we receive it here, and we are just calling increment. Okay. When this is finished, when this is finished, when uh, when the 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 customer, the consumer, closes the stream, and when it closes the stream, we return this final value. This is the final value we send back, and that's pretty much it. Creating a, a consumer. Okay, um, all these examples, all these examples that I'm showing you, you can get them down. Let me find right now where it is. No, it's not here. Give me a second. It must be here, this guy. JPC.net, yeah. All those examples, I would love to say that I created them, but nope. All of them are here, yeah, and you can see many other examples of bidirectional streaming. Uh, you even have a mid processor there, uh, fast speed uh, streaming, and many other options there. Examples simple and clear as the one I'm mentioning you. So I, I, I would like to refer you to that to that set of examples to see uh, to see the possibilities. Oh, let's go ahead. Uh, Okay, now that we have a certain understanding of this thing, let's compare with uh, Web API, ba basically. Uh, do note that, uh, first of all, gRPC requires a contract, and the contract is defined in a proto file. Okay, so there's another piece uh, that we have to use. Uh, meanwhile, in Web API, uh, of course, you can use Swagger. Uh, how many of you is, use Open API, Swagger, or, or something like that? Almost everyone, almost everyone. So that's interesting because, in principle, with uh, REST and JSON, you don't need a contract. But real life imposes you that it's a better idea to have a contract. That why, that's why we use Open API and, uh, and Swagger and similar things. So gRPC says, OK, that's a fact of life, so let's have a, let's have a contract always. The protocol, mandatorily, is HTTP2. It doesn't work with, uh, with the all one, all the one uh, HTTP. The payload is binary in uh, in, HD, in Web API is JSON, but it does have an advantage. JSON we can read it. The binary we can't. People are working in extensions and plugins so that uh, so that the, it can uh, open up and interpret for us the uh, the protocol of binaries. But that's a work in progress right now. Um, uh, gRPC is far more demanding, it's far more strict in what you can send, what you can do. Uh, you have more freedom in what you send, uh, the headers you can use, additional information you can, you can send in the, uh, in the HTTP body with the Web API, and some of us use it for advantage. Uh, if you are used to that kind of tricks, <laughs> you are not going to be able to use them in gRPC, or at least not easily. Uh, Streaming uh, is interesting because uh, you can do client streaming in both options, server streaming. Bidirectional streaming is one specific ability of HTTP2. Okay. Uh, ah, one problem, one important problem. Um, you can call a Web API directly from a browser, and many of us use it for testing or for trying quickly things. You cannot do that right now with gRPC. Again, people is, is working in, uh, in extensions for being able to do that. Uh, both use transport TLS and, uh, uh, well, one interesting thing is that gRPC is uh, it's strongly based in uh, code generation. Okay, so when we want to use gRPC, microservices, uh, near real-time communication, Polyglot environments, where you have uh, many languages uh, used by many programmers, and 
when you have uh, network constraints. Um, and these guys are the perfect example. You can use HTTP2 in Android and in, uh, and in iOS, and then you can create a customer for uh, HTTP2 or gRPC services and use far less of the, uh, of, the of the data plan of your users. They, they are going to like it. To end with, uh, you can get more information in those addresses, uh, especially this, that uh, small booklet, it's just a few pages long, uh, will help uh, us using Windows Communication Foundation to see how to move or start using gRPC. And that's pretty much it. So what do you think? Did I want a beer or what? <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>